how my parents, friends, kid, and therefore my friend, Evan, hit the ball off the tee and ran to first base to the cheers of his parents, my parents, all the parents, his coach, and his team, until he finally reached the base and safe. It was then that I turned to my mother and asked, can I do this next year? Seeing Evan in the spotlight, receiving the applause of his instant friends, his team, it was enviable, and I wanted in. After all, all I had to do to get it was to hit a ball off a tee. Well, the first disappointment of my one and only year as a Little League baseball player came at registration when I discovered I would not get to hit a ball off a tee. But at the age of eight years old, I had aged out of being able to play tee ball. If I wanted to participate, I would have to serve as target practice for kids my own age called pitchers who would whip a hard ball in my general direction. This was daunting to me. I had never stood at a plate and had a hard ball pitched at me, but I remembered the spotlight and the promise of the camaraderie, and I signed up anyway. But if that was my first disappointment, my first humiliation came the first day of practice when I showed up with my socks upside down. Now, you wouldn't think you could do this, but these were the stirrup socks that you actually wear over your athletic socks. They're just a tube of sock with a little dangly loop at one end, and you're supposed to pull it up, and the loop goes under your heel, and it looks like you're in the stirrup of a saddle on a horse. Now, I don't know if I didn't know they were called stirrup socks at the time, or if I just didn't know what a stirrup was, but I could not figure out how to put on this sock. So I ended up putting them on upside down so that instead of the loop being under my heel, it was just hanging loosely, uh, uselessly from the back of my thigh. Uh, it was my coach who pointed this out in the middle of practice. I was having a catch with some kid in the outfield and, uh, and I was embarrassed because I had sort of struggled with, am I doing this right? And I clearly hadn't. Now, I just wanted to leave it alone because uh, I didn't want to call any more attention to it, but he made me change my socks right there in the outfields and make them right. And I just felt like everybody was staring at me. So humiliation from the get-go. Things didn't get any better when we started batting practice. It turns out that uh, the fear I thought I might have at having a hard ball whipped at me was real. I could not stand at the plate without shaking. Also, I could not judge a strike from a ball. So until it was like already past me, you know? So basically I wasn't swinging at all because I didn't know which balls to swing at. Finally, my coach was just like, just swing at anything that looks even remotely close. And I tried to pick those balls out, but because I couldn't judge it until too late, I'm swinging at the air after the ball has already gone by. Uh, finally, when the season starts, I come up with my own strategy. As I'm walking up to the plate for my at-bats, I decide right then, this time I'm going to swing at the first pitch, or this time I'm going to swing at the third pitch, whatever it was. Uh, that way, at least I stood a reasonable chance of swinging on time. I don't know if the strategy worked for me or not. I do know I got to first base a few times, but they were probably mostly from walks or getting hit by a pitch. I do know that I never, never had that pow moment, that moment of running to first, the cheers of my parents, everybody's parents, my coach and my team. That never happened. And if I was a bad batter, I was an even worse fielder. I could never throw my ball to the target that I intended. I could not judge where fly balls were coming down so that I could appropriately get under them. But my biggest humiliation came from trying to field a line drive to the outfield. I was playing left, usually a busy position. I have no idea how I got to be assigned to that position, but there I was. And a line drive went in between the shortstop and the third baseman and came rolling to me in the outfield. All right, I knew what to do. I got down on one knee and put my mitt down and they had my back up straight. Uh, best case scenario, the ball rolls into my glove. Worst case scenario, it bounces, maybe hits me on the chest, still lands in front of me and I can manage it and make some kind of play, maybe. So I'm sitting there with, in position, waiting for the ball. It's coming towards me and I'm waiting and it's coming towards me and then finally it's about to hit my glove when whoosh, the right fielder 
has sprinted diagonally across the field and scooped up the ball right before it entered my mitt. He throws it in to stop all the running that's been happening while I've been sitting out there waiting for the ball to roll to me. And as he returns to his position, he calls over his shoulder, you're supposed to rush the ball. Oh yeah, I forgot. It really speeds things up a bit if you try to meet the ball halfway. I can laugh about it now, but I was pretty devastated, very humiliated. And I don't know how I made it through the entire season without quitting. Probably my parents wouldn't let me, and maybe they did, they did the right thing. But we're, we're at this end of the year party with all the team, you know. It's at this kid's house up the street from me, uh, far up the street, but walkable. And the coach comes, and he gives everybody a brand new baseball. And everybody's passing their balls around, having each other sign our baseballs. Finally, some camaraderie. And uh, I'm passing mine around, and I'm a completionist, I guess. I wanted everybody's signature. So I give it to that right fielder that had humiliated me in the outfield. I mean, I guess I humiliated myself, but I didn't like this kid. And, uh, and, uh, and he signs it kind of messy and gives it back to me. And I look at it, and I can't read it, but I'm thinking maybe this is how the cool kids sign the ball. Or, you know, it looks a little bit maybe like a pro ball player's signature. So I, I almost don't think anything of it. But then I hear him tell another kid, I signed Levy's ball sloppy on purpose. That was all I needed to hear. I put the ball down on the coffee table next to my unfinished cup of soda, and I pretended to forget it when I left and made the long walk home. It might have been worse if I had any passion about baseball at all, but it still was pretty bad. 42 years later, in 2018, I still did not have a great passion for baseball. But as Bridget mentioned, I had a passion for storytelling, and I was in my eighth season of producing storytelling events, not unlike this one, as part of that organization. And um, we had just moved into this big hall that Bridget mentioned, and we had a board now, and uh, it was exciting. It was important that we pick themes for our shows. All of our shows have themes that, that would be a draw, you know? And, um, and someone said, we should do the theme of baseball. <sighs> I didn't like very baseball very much, but we're in Cincinnati. It makes sense. We're a baseball town. We should do this. And it's a good idea. It provides a great draw. We get a big audience. We even have two World Series ring wearers as storytellers in the show. 1968 world champion Detroit Tigers relief pitcher John Warden and uh, Big Red Machine, Cincinnati Reds, MVP and uh, uh, great outfielder George Foster tell stories at the show as well as local news anchor uh, Brian Hammer from Channel 5, and three lesser famous people. Although, maybe not to you, as Bridget Flaherty was one of them. And, uh, and it was a great show. And I have to tell you, producing these shows is, um, it's, the thing I love about it most is working with the storytellers and helping them to shape their story into something that they feel proud to have shared on stage. I feel my most fulfilled when I know the storytellers who share their stories feel fulfilled. It fills my tank, if you will. Nothing makes me happier, which is a good thing because uh, I have a day job that pays my bills. This organization is like another full-time job, doesn't pay me, Scott. Uh, it is a real labor of love. So if I wasn't getting something out of it, um, I don't know why I would be doing it at all. Uh, so that's what fills me up. But at the end of the baseball show, uh, much to my surprise, Bar Brian Hammer gathers all the storytellers together and they all come over and Brian says, we have this gift for you. And he hands me this signed baseball. And it is a clever gift, right? It comes from everybody. It doesn't cost a lot. It's from the heart. And, uh, and the theme of the show is baseball. And it's a very thoughtful gift. I don't usually get gifts from the storytellers at the end of the show. We give the storytellers gifts to thank them for their time and for helping us put together a great show. But what they didn't realize when they handed me this ball was that it was also a perfect gift. It was only the second signed baseball of my life. The first one I told you about, I left on the coffee table when I was eight years old. That ball 
represented me chasing after glory, even if I had to participate in an activity about which I had no passion. This ball represented me chasing my passion and occasionally getting some glory as a result of it. It means the world to me. And when I'm not telling a story about it, it sits on a shelf right over there where I can see it when I look up from work now that I'm working from home every day. And whenever I need a little boost, I just look over at this ball on the shelf and I think to myself, pow.